I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Leila Josefowitz, um, who devotes pretty much her entire career to performing new music. Her heartfelt new music advocacy helped win her a MacArthur Fellowship in 2008. And she will be performing tonight with one of her regular partners, the pianist, composer, and arranger, John Novacek. Please welcome them both. So I thought we would kind of work backwards through the program and start with the Adams. Um, the, the library has commissioned uh, two, two works actually from Adams, the road movies that you're playing tonight and the string quartet as well. And he also did a residency here in 2013. Um, and you probably wouldn't know this, but I actually played the, the New World Symphony in 2002 when you played it with John Adams conducting. This is a oh. long, long, long time ago. Um, <laughs> and I remember, yeah, you, look, you know, this piece is a, a really brilliant technical tour de force. The John Adams violin concerto. The John Adams, right. yeah, right. Yeah, the oh, first that, was violin. A, that was a long time ago. Yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> kind of yeah. dating one another. But um, your close relationship to Adams actually goes nearly 20 years, I would say. So what drew Definitely. You, yeah, so what drew you to his music in the first place? And how has his music evolved from the violin concerto that's written in 93 to the road movies in 95 to the second violin concerto that he wrote for you? Yes, well... Johnny is one of my best friends, um, to say the least, and uh, I'm the only, uh, he proudly tells me that um, I'm the only one besides his mother that calls him Johnny. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I met John, Johnny, I was uh, 20, and uh, I'm 42 now, so. Um, but <clears throat> his piece was really the first piece that got me, the violin concerto, um, that got me on my path to where I am now, which is basically, aside from the great dead composers, which you completely couldn't ignore, such as Bartok, Stravinsky, and Berg, um, not to um, only select but them, but um, my devotion to <clears throat> the, the living composers really did start with John. Um, and um, out of kind of sheer desperation um, in some ways to kind of rid myself of only the classics and only the expected and only the traditional masterpieces, which deserve the attention, of course, I was getting um, claustrophobic in that world. Um, and that's, that's my issue. <laughs> I mean, the great classics are, are, of course, deservedly need to be played, but I felt that um, they are getting overplayed um, and people are um, getting too comfortable um, in what they're expecting to hear. And um, so I thought, um, okay, I'm going to just try this. And I, I told my management at the time, just a different management, um, so I really want to play this piece. And the response was, well, but we've only... We've had five performances, and that's a lot. You might not be able to. You might not be able to bring this around much. And I thought, what? Like. Yeah, but you've literally played it. I thought, everywhere. what if we said that about Beethoven <laughs> or Brahms? Like, we wouldn't have anything to play. We wouldn't play anything. So I thought, okay, fine. Well, let's just let's just program this anyway. Um, so I I programmed um, the first time that. John Adams Violin Concerto in Seattle. Um, I had only met him once before that. Oh, okay. So this was just kind of my curiosity and my thing and mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. And he came to that. Um, and we hardly really knew each other at that point because I was, um, I was uh, 21, the second time I met him. Um, and he came to that concert and we got along fine. And, but boom, after that, um, I had lined up in the diary at least six performances per year with him conducting after that encounter. Um, and that just completely and totally shifted my world um, to have all of a sudden great collaboration with a composer conductor. Um, so that inspired me to, um, from that point on, devote myself to that realm, um, which has been totally amazing. Oliver Nussen, whose uh, manuscript is in the hall, um, 
another very, very dear person to me, yeah. um, who I worked with um, for about this length of time, over 20 years. Um, and it's just been, you know, the, the, all of these great, incredible um, universal minds um, have been the thing that has shaped me. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that was one thing that I was, I mean, that, that's one of the things I was going to mention next is that in addition to Adams, um, Ali Nussen also had a, a strong collaboration with the Library of Congress and we commissioned several of his works and he did a residency here just in 2014. Well, I remember seeing the video of his, okay. of his interview. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, and uh, you write on your website that, uh, oh, oh, well, that um, he was your dear friend, inspiration, mentor, and colleague, and I and the world will miss him very much. And I actually got to work with him at Tanglewood myself. And yeah, you know, he was such a, uh, yeah, you know, he was just the nicest guy and a, an amazing composer, so concise. How did you come to get to know him? And have you played the reflections before? Because that's his penultimate piece, or is Yes, it, uh, I mean, in fact, I played it at his, um, John and I played it at his memorial which was uh, very powerful. Um, it's actually on YouTube, those of you that may have known or met him here. Um, but I met him basically at, at just about the same time as I met Adams. Okay. Um, and his concerto had been written for Pinky Zuckerman. Um, and we had um, a first performance set up in Oslo. Um, and it was, I think it was 2002 or something like this. Um, and we ended up going to an Indian restaurant and staying there for six hours. <laughs> um, and um, he was just so fantastic and great. Um, and that started a long um, collaboration. And uh, I learned I learned so much from um, the creators. Um, I learned things that, of course, in school, um, we would never be able to learn um, in the same way about a, a non-living composer. Yeah, that's um, very true. That's but fair. John Novacek here, of course, also knows John Adams well, too, because we've done the road movies so this. many times. Um, so this is a natural. Yeah. Have you played any of his, um, have you played any of his piano music, like Century Rolls or any of the... Well, I haven't. I'd like to, I've been trying to get my manager to get an opportunity for me to learn century roles. That hasn't happened yet. That's his piano concerto. He wrote that for Emmanuel Axe, I think, right? And uh, I did um, this year play Hallelujah Junction, which is his two piano work, and that was a lot of fun. And it's always uh, kind of irritating at first. <laughs> That's so hard to... So it, easy to get off a little bit, but it's that's another great piece. We this road movies we played. I mean, it's, it's got to be over a hundred times at this point. So this and really we is, recorded it too. We can you know broadcast all of our. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Plug our CDs, but yeah, I mean, we recorded that already over fifteen years ago, probably yes. with with John Adams present at that. So. Um, that is, uh, this is a very dear piece to us, and I know, and of course it's particularly special playing it here, um, where it was commissioned. I remember, uh, it might be a little different because I remember when I was learning the piece, talking to Vicki Ray, who was the first pianist who premiered it here, and she said, oh, that last movement, it was twice, a lo twice as long when he first wrote that, oh, okay. and I premiered oh, okay. it. He cut it way down. <laughs> <laughs> so I had fewer notes to learn than she did. Yeah. But that actually would add a whole lev new level of endurance to... Yeah. If you <laughs> haven't year, heard too. road movies yet, you will understand what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> Um, as a pianist, what do you find are the particular difficulties in playing John Adams' music? Well, uh, most um, composers have been able to play piano. Some of them have been great pianists and others are, are capable. I mean, you can kind of tell uh, composers how they sounded, must sound at the piano. I mean, John Adams, you can see a lot of his are alternating hands. I mean, you can see this, so that he's probably improvises a bit like that at the keyboards. And um, I think just the, the steadiness, the ensemble, you know, some of the traits he's well known for, the little shifts 
of meter. It, it might seem like it's long stretches in 4-4, four, 3-4, four, four, but there are a lot of internal shifts that happen. And so um, you might feel comfortable after a while and then just lose your focus for a hundredth of a second and then uh, you're like, oh boy, you know. That. <laughs> well, John actually put it perfectly when we were um, playing Shaker Loops. If any of you know this piece, Shaker Loops, um, so I had a rather disastrous performance of a septet of that um, in which, and to his irritation, he was conducting, but all <laughs> seven of us, I think, really didn't know where the other was. Um, and in rehearsal, he said to us, you know, just think of it like this, you know, you're on a highway um, and you have to stay on and always take the right exit because if you don't take the right exit, you can never get back on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly right when you have <laughs> these shifts that are so subtle sometimes. Um, and one note from one player will cause the start of the shift. Um, so to really know the piece um, whichever piece it is, extremely well. You have to actually know when, who, what, where, why, how. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, I, I would say, look, it seems like his music really requires a certain kind of concentration to... The, the way. And also a, a very deeply rooted internal rhythm, um, which John and I have for sure. Johnny um, Novacek and I have very well. We have been playing together 34 years. 34 years, wow. <laughs> did you, where did you meet? <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> so then how did you two come to meet then? Was it in school? Um, was it Well, I was, uh, we were both in Los Angeles at the time. Um, uh, to uh, be accurate, I, th I think it was 32, right? So, <laughs> well, that, <laughs> but I don't know. We, not to, to split hairs, but in any case, uh, Leela was obviously very young. She was working with a violin professor in Los Angeles named Robert Lipset, yeah, Robert who had uh, an incredible class. I mean, you may know of some of his other students have gone on to become concert masters of our great orchestras and such. Um, but Leela was, uh, was clearly a, a star rising and I started, I was playing for his class at that time and, and uh, he was al already, you know, asked me if I want to travel around with Leela and her family. She's already, she was doing um, uh, quite remarkable things. I mean, playing sort of, uh, sort of the Hollywood glamour <laughs> things like Tonight Show and Bob Hope Show and oh, things okay. like that. It was a really so, odd way to, um, well, every prodigy's life is odd, but um, this was the West Coast style <laughs> product. It truly was. I mean, TV shows, um, gala dinners for you know, Charlton Heston and um, Zsa Zsa Gabor. <laughs> <laughs> and former presidents. <laughs> former presidents. We did so one, um, one thing we did um, was for Reagan, Carter, and Ford. And you know, three dozen um, teams of sniffing dogs. Oh, okay. wow. um, <laughs> um, Van Clyburn and um, Lucille Ball introduced me on this show. Um, I mean, it was really kind of nuts the it's whole thing. Wild, I would um, say. Yeah. But John grew up with me. I mean, doing these things out on the West Coast. They, I'll let you can now continue. <laughs> no, well, in fairness, I was. Uh, Theoretically grown up already, <laughs> quite a bit older. But um, yeah, it was it was kind of a wild ride. You doing that that stuff for a while. Then after about uh, you know eight years of that or something, then then when she was at Curtis and and she in high school, then she really started getting recital tours. And so um, uh, I was pleased that. Um, uh, she and her family and management still called me to do these recitals, and, and here we are after all that time. So The thing is about a great collaboration is that it's about so much more than just agreeing on how we'll perform something. I yeah, mean, a, a great collaboration means that you, um, 
you really internally feel things together um, and that you know each other's kind of habits and quirks. Even, you know, on, off stage, you know kind of what the earth, other person likes to do before the concert, you know um, how they function. Um, you can travel well with them. I mean, you can imagine that if those things aren't lined up, all of a sudden the, the collaboration is, is not, um, no, it, as it's not, not as productive, as, nor yeah. is it as enjoyable. I mean, when you have um, two people on stage doing full programs together, it has to be, um, it has to be um, an enjoyable experience for, for each one of us. So um, that's why we're here. Well, that's great. Well, we're, we're really glad to have you both. It's glad to see that you guys can make great jokes together and banter together. That's really wonderful. Um, <laughs> no, I think that's awesome. So no, that's wonderful. Um, so let's just talk a little bit more about the program, but we can always venture off. I'm more than happy to venture off on we other might. topics. <laughs> Please do, by all means. But um, yeah, let's just talk a little bit about Janacek and... Um, yeah, like I was just speaking with John and I, I had asked him, well, how do you actually pronounce your name? I thought it was Novacek, but I wanted to ask him to be sure and he said his name is actually Czech. Um, um, so um, what I really like is that you've combined this early piece of his with the late violin sonata. And it's funny, I remember when I was at the New World Symphony, you did a master class with um, students there and, um, and one of the students played the Mozart fifth violin concerto and I remember you started you were trying to get them to liven it up and to have more personality. And like you said, you have to pretend like you're Donna Anna or you're Donna Elvira. And I thought she is amazing because she knows the whole oeuvre of what Mozart has done and knows how how his operas relate to the concerti. And as you know, that, that Janicek, he's also an opera composer. Do you have any operatic characters from Janicek that you kind of use to relate to the violin sonata at all? Like well, I'm, it's Akasha, so... Or, um, it's so folksy. Um, I listened actually with Oliver Nussen, one of our, it's a very kind of powerful memory. Um, our last drive, we, I used to go visit him in Snape in England. Um, and he would go for nature drives. We call it nature drive. Let's go for nature drive. <laughs> so we get in the car and he had his um, classical music, I think it was a, the London, the BBC Radio 3 on, um, and he was always just curious what was on um, whenever the car started, just see what's on. And our last, um, our last listening session, um, I visited only a few days before he passed, um, and it was um, House of the Dead. Oh, totally, um, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we listened to probably three quarters of the opera just driving around and he picked out all, like, of course, this wasn't in English, but he knew every single word. He knew every single character. He knew exactly what they were saying. And then he'd be like, oh, but this isn't the version I knew with so-and-so. I can't even remember what yeah. he said, but this is not that version. They would have done something else right there. Um, and so it was really amazing to hear him talk about all the inflections and the characters and listening to that and I bring that like right into the right into the sonata it's so human um, and it's almost like this kind of modern day Viennese school um, kind of Sprechstimme yeah, it's very free. No, yeah, it's kind of very free and yeah, like, yeah, I know what you mean. No, it's not modern. I shouldn't have said modern, but it is speaking. To me, it's speaking, um, especially um, the first movement is really um, like a form of, of talking and conversing and just kind of making sounds and then, you know, moods immediately shifting, um, which is very characteristic of composers and eccentric artists. Moods are always shifting. But um, the, to capture the, um, these changes and these abrupt changes in an organic way is um, what John and I, I think we've been sort of working towards all the time. Um, the second movement has this sort of um, celestial um, yet kind of grounded feel to it. Um, 
it's an interesting combination of emotions and the way that um, Janáček uses harmony, very unconventional. Um, there's certain chords that you would expect to fall in a certain place, but maybe it's not quite that chord, it's a different chord with you know an inverted different chord, um, which changes the whole mood of what you would expect the phrase to sound like, mm -hmm. um, and to kind of mold um, things around these changes of, of harmony, I, I think is really fascinating. When, when you're um, working so much with contemporary music, um, so many contemporary composers um, love Jan Acek for this reason. Now, John, when you compare the Dumka to the Sonata, how are they different from your perspective? Well, I think um, the audience will hear they're very different. I mean, the Sonata, Janáček is uh, one of those rare composers who, most of whose works we know he wrote after the age of 60. Yeah. And in fact, the first version of this violin sonata was written, I believe, when he was about 60. And there are various reasons. He did have a muse. He fell in love with someone that was quite a bit younger. and and. Uh, who knows the psychology that that makes it up exactly, but it is uh, it's can be inspiring for some of us in middle age that <laughs> there the, this is possible this this kind of level of creative inspiration. But uh, the Dumka kind of this kind of melancholy Ukrainian original this sort of song or dance. Uh, it's very early. Sometimes it feels almost a little Tchaikovskyan, some of the harmonies and stuff. But you hear some of the more individual stuff coming out. I mean, the, the sonata, like you're both saying it, uh, I would hear my father, I never spoke Czech, but I'd hear him speak in Czech sometimes. And I at least imagine I hear some of those speech rhythms in this music. And it's, and uh, there are obsessive qualities, little, uh, of figures they call ostinatos that'll go on and on in either either instrument or the last couple moments I seem to carry on this line and Leela's role is more of like a disruptor I mean she keeps just I love this doing role. graffiti on what I'm doing until she soars with the, the melody at the end it's very powerful so it's I've I've never played another piece like this and uh, it does certainly relate to his operas and yeah. other instrumental stuff I have to explain why I love disruptive playing so much. <laughs> I mean, it's just because, um, of course, it comes from my youth and that I had such a, um, well, I mean, it was an incredibly um, structured and um, you know, in the best ways, it was very uh, traditional uh, training and that you, know, you learn the technique thoroughly a violin playing in every which way, and then you start with um, the great classics. You go from you know the the Bruch to the Mendelssohn to the Glazunov to the Tchaikovsky, Sibelius, Beethoven, Brahms. You of course you that's what you need to learn, and that's what you should learn. Um, you would never dream of skipping over these things, but so much of what that training is about is um, you know sort of homage to the past, great players, um, what makes them great, comparative listening, um, knowing which fingering Heifetz used, which fingering Oistrakh used, what Boeing Chrysler did, um, Huberman, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Paganini Caprices, who's really um, unbelievable at number five, who can do that, that um, three to one ricochet Boeing, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, but, you know, mostly um, beauty, beauty of sound, um, tone, um, always aiming for that, that luminous, beautiful sound. Um, and then you realize as I've gotten older that life, um, to me, music reflects life. Um, how much of life is always beautiful? Um, how much of it is always about, you know, elegance? Um, well, some of it, but certainly not a lot of it. Um, and I was more into kind of reflecting all of our emotions and, and feelings and have it represent um, more of a real life rather than, 
in the glass box. Um, and, you know, I love pieces that emphasize that. And this Janicek is certainly one of them in that um, I'm sort of like in certain movement, like the last movement, I'm, um, I'm just, uh, I'm an obsessive, um, neurotic, um, maybe it's some kind of, you know, um, infestation of some, you know, obsessive, disturbing thought um, that I just, I keep just interrupting him. I, I can't get rid of me. Um, and it, it's, it's really wonderful. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> it's not the whole piece isn't like that, but I mean, the fact that here's a composer that isn't even remotely trying no, he's to, not trying to be like anyone else. To please else. Yeah. people in that sort of traditional way. I love this um, based on my past. Um, and I just, maybe it's just my character anyway. But um, this is one of the things that for me is an adventure to, um, it's not always about, you know, comforting. It's, yeah. it's also about kind of going like, wow, that kind of got under my skin. Um, you know, that's memorable. Yeah. One thing, we, just going back to what John kind of lightly referred to, and like you were probably just trying to be diplomatic to Janicek, but it, yeah, you know, um, when he was 60, he had a very, uh, uh, he acquired a mistress that was very young. She was maybe barely 20 or something like this. And um, <laughs> no, when, but yes, and yeah, look, you're being very polite, but it's actually interesting to sort of think about these sort of things. I mean, when he was writing his violin sonata, he had just acquired this mistress. Um, she was a singer. and. Um, and you know he had been married to the same woman for years and years and years. And what yeah, like you know, in reading his biography, I read that he actually moved the mistress into their house. And so that's you very, really researched this. You know, well, no, not well, yeah, like just reading about Janicek. It, yeah, like you know, when you <laughs> see his operas, his operas can be so realistic, like yeah. life. And it, so Sorry to exactly tease you. Exactly. No, <laughs> no, but no, but you're absolutely right. I mean, his way of writing is so realistic and it's so confrontational. You get, yeah, like, you know, like Yenufa, it's about pretty much about abortion in a way. So I mean, um, yeah, you know, I know what you mean when, yeah, you know, he talks, yeah, you know, when in how Janicek tries to show real life emotions in the music. So yeah, we look forward to seeing your, you guys' interpretation of this piece. <laughs> So very much so. Um, do you have any, but so, yeah, you know, you're so known for advocating for new music and composers and yeah, like, you know, um, um, yeah, do you have any upcoming projects that you're really excited about that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, um, so I try to, uh, you know, at least every other year um, bring something new into the repertoire. Um, and this sometimes is easier said than done. Um, a lot of the greatest composers, it seems right now, are, are very obsessed of, um, over opera. Um, and maybe a, a violin and orchestral work seems um, kind of smaller <laughs> to them in some ways. But um, I have not always just commissioned. Um, I, I love um, discovering the great pieces yeah. um, that perhaps were commissioned, you know, less than ten years ago, or even less than five years ago, um, that for some reason hadn't haven't lifted off the ground, or need more attention, or um, just you know, the composer asked me, "Will you, um, will you take this one?" Um, and so it's not only commissions, but those two. Mm -hmm. um, so um, an example of one that's just been written, not for me actually, but um, I'm gonna take on is the piece by Helen Grime. She's a young British composer um, and um, worked some of the time with Oliver Nusson. Um, and he actually um, programmed a lot of her music. So I was very familiar with her for many years. Um, and it's wonderful to kind of continue this great um, tradition of British contemporary music. Um, so that's in April. Yeah. Okay, Helen Grimes. Um, okay. um, so that's coming up. Um, Thomas Addis is um, writing us a violin and piano uh, work. 
um, hopefully we'll have it completed and uh, we'll, we'll do that um, at the end of May. Um, then, of course, me and John will be taking that around as well, which is exciting. Um, so we get the music. Yeah, Plenty of time. Yeah, yeah, he writes very difficult music. So, yeah. One of the things that is always a suspenseful um, part of working with uh, composers is begging them on my knees to give me enough time to prepare um, in the way in which they ultimately would prefer any artist to prepare. Um, it's very difficult to create something extraordinary. Um, so they have my full sympathy. Um, so, you know, that's always a, a, a suspenseful part of this, but um, I wouldn't change anything, I'd still continue. But anyways, um, so we got those two things, and then um, Andrew Norman is going to be writing me a piece for 21. Oh, wow, exciting. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and as we speak, working on the next couple of ideas. So it's, it's always a work, work in progress as to um, find the right combinations of personalities and um, kinds of creati creativity to make a match. I mean, you can't just, of course, just pair people together, so. Yeah, no, um, of course. Yeah. But um, when you receive a new piece, do you sometimes have to give a lot of feedback or does it, oh, um, how does that process work when you're getting a new piece and you're trying to um, help a composer understand and help them along? How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, it really depends so individually um, on each person. Um, some composers want my input the whole way through. Um, some basically want none. Um, but I would say that every composer, um, if it's a commission, um, if I say to them, okay, I've seen what you've written so far, I say, you know, something like, Am I correct in thinking that this mood, this is kind of what you're wanting, this sort of feeling, or this kind of et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you are open to this suggestion, I would say perhaps this way of doing what you're wanting may work a little better on the violin, or you know, another alternative could be this, or you know, maybe a little more of this kind of feeling with this technique, and if you think what I'm saying is something that uh, you don't like, you can just completely forget I ever said anything. <laughs> um, and just go from yeah. there. But you know, if I'm respectful, which I am, um, the composer's thoughts on paper um, are so completely intentionally there for a reason. Um, so I take that incredibly seriously, unless there's something that really actually can't work. I have a very good reason to say why. Yeah. Um, they'll listen. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, maybe we, if you don't mind, could we maybe take a couple of questions from the audience and then we'll finish? Is, are, does anyone have a question for our two guests? Um, wait, please wait one second, wait for the mic. Cord, okay. cord. Oh. Um, the last things you were saying made me think, how much does Mr. Novacek uh, participate in dealing with a new commission? Well, we have a new commission. Um, it's it's yet to, to find out, I guess, on that. I mean, the Addis, Addis himself is a, a concert pianist, is a wonderful pianist, so I, I'm sure he wouldn't be seeking my advice, but um, <laughs> um, I tend to adjust music to what works for me in any case, so. <laughs> Whether the composer is living or dead, so. And may not, may not always win the approval, but, uh, but, so. But actually, what you're saying, I mean, can you elaborate on that? Because it's really true. Um, it, it was sort of said in jest, but. Uh, in terms of, well, I mean, I guess I'm at an age where like you're saying, you might um, propose to a composer, you know, this might work better, this, you know, every pianist, every 
instrumentalists also are going to have their strong and weaker points. And I've gotten to the point where I realize what works for me. So I'm uh, more willing these days, even if it's Beethoven or Mozart, and I mean, it's somewhat maybe find this ghastly, but if I need to rearrange something a little bit or something I think can pull it off better in, in what I'm trying to say, I'll, I'll do that. And, um, but these can be like incredibly subtle things, whether it means, you know, you change a fingering, you change a bowing. Um, right, it, it, can, it can range from subtle to a little less subtle. I was recording something last week and the producer was a little surprised how I did something that was in print and uh, a little bit different, but um, I stuck to my guns there and <laughs> we'll see, one might get criticized for that. But I always feel that the important, uh, you have a certain vision for a piece of music and you wanna put that across and you're doing the composer the most honor if you can do it your best and what works best for you. So I sort of go by that. So sometimes, uh, I don't even like playing for the living composers because <laughs> they, they might make me change it back, so. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, the, the urtext mentality, um, which, of course, is what I think most people would consider the most respectful mentality. Here you have Bach's six sonatas and partitas written out in his hand in the back of your score, which is printed, you refer back to these things and um, you know, players may change from there and then, you know, tisk tisk, but look at, look at what the Boeing is in the urtext. Um, and we'll never have the opportunity to say, hey, um, Mr. Bach, um, what about this kind of Boeing? Because, um, you know, my hand works better when I, my arm suits this, this character that you're asking for. This bowing is a little better for me. Is that cool for you? <laughs> Never will be able to do that. Um, but what John's main point is that always what the composer is wanting, um, mood-wise, gesture-wise, is really the most important thing. So. As players, we have to be human about this, um, and we have to approach it in a way that makes us feel that we are doing that job the best. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to say, uh, sorry to jump in again, but it's it's marvelous to to have the display. Hope you, you can see of, of some of these pieces, both either manuscript or first editions, and the Stravinsky we're playing. Uh, there's a weird fingering in the printed edition, which I don't do, but I feel particularly guilty now because I see that Stravinsky himself <laughs> wrote those in. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it might be part of his effect, so we'll see. I might switch that back tonight. Don't, don't switch. Okay, don't, don't. well, we'll see. Good. Don't switch, okay. <laughs> don't switch. Okay, well, does anyone have maybe one more short question and then we'll have to stop? Okay. Oh, wait, wait one second. I'll give you my mic. Thank you. What kind of variability do you see in the manuscripts or, say, the published versions of pieces you're playing and how well they've been edited? Uh, do you find much variability? Do you get pieces where you're all of a sudden finding, maybe from your point of view, wasting time on whether that note is right, does it fit the chord, or so forth? You know, this kind of nitpicking. Now, it gets more complicated the larger the ensemble, right? Uh, there are more notes to be dealt with. Uh, but, you know, as soloists, it's one-on-one -on -one and uh, are very small. You know. Well, I have a funny, um, well, not that funny, actually, this um, story relating to this. So um, the reflection that you're going to hear tonight, um, his penultimate work, um, was just starting to get published um, a few months before the memorial. Um, and it was decided um, pretty much right away after his death that I would be playing this with John at the memorial. Um, and the first drafts of the print started coming into me. Um, meanwhile, I had taken 
um, photographs of his manuscript, um, which um, were actually in his house on his desk. I was taking um, photos with my iPhone um, and just looking at those and originally starting work from those. Um, so this, the first prints come in and it's sort of like the more you see, the more you find. Um, <laughs> probably found about 50 mistakes, um, if not more. And I started just circling them in red and sending them to Faber back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So um, I don't usually get to do that job, but I actually feel very um, privileged um, that I got to do that. Um, so if, if I have a second job, I could possibly be a, a music editor because I'm so thorough with respecting every single dot, um, every single accidental, every single rest, every single way in which the bar line was, I mean, Ollie was amazing because he was so meticulous. Every single line, whether it was for a note or a bar, a measure, um, he used a ruler. Um, so it's so clean. I mean, when you see his um, manuscript of Philia, yeah. Yeah, it's, very neat. Um, it's so gorgeous. And um, right now we are, um, we play from um, the manuscript. Which, of course, brings back memories of him at every turn, since I used to sit with him at his desk while he, well, his hugeness was curled over this tiny pencil, um, kind of looming over this piece of paper. Um, it was so cool to, to be, have that in my memory. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful chat. It's really been a pleasure to speak with both of you. Thank you so much. Thank We're you. looking very much to the concert. Thank you so much. <laughs>